We are live. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for your patience. I'm sorry that executive session went over a bit, but thank you very much for your patience. Um, next on the public agenda is item 2.01, our budget work, third budget budget workshop. Um, Mr. Furlong. Mr. Furlong, I've made you a host of the meeting so you can share your screen. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Okay, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, <clears throat> this is our third and final uh, budget workshop. Uh, you know, we're pretty much going to hit some of the highlights. Uh, you know, the budget really hasn't changed a whole lot since our meeting two weeks ago, uh, but we did make uh, some minor modifications. So the agenda for this evening is once again to uh, you know, go through the revenue uh, for the preliminary budget. You know, uh, once again, uh, the cornerstone of the revenue is the governor's executive budget proposal. And we are again hopeful that we will receive the final um, New York State budget passed on or around April 1st. We'll go through the tax value limit calculation and then we did have um, some items of miscellaneous revenue that were revised since our last meeting. And we'll go over those in detail. On the expenditure side of the budget, uh, because we did reduce revenue, we did uh, need to bring our expenditures down and we'll kind of go through those as well. Uh, but once again, the uh, changes were fairly minimal. Uh, we could talk a little bit about the bus proposition and then finally the remaining budget calendar. So general overview, um, first and foremost, I want to stress this uh, as much as possible that the preliminary budget, not only does it maintain all existing programs uh, for our students, but it is also a full return to five day instruction um, and all pre pandemic athletics and activities for our students as well. Uh, we do have new debt coming on uh, from recently completed building projects, including the high school, Unders Road, and Wellwood. Uh, Wellwood is still a work in process, but we do have some uh, financing that we need to do to continue that project. We're also seeing some cost increases in health insurance, retirement system costs, and contractual salary increases. <clears throat> and the resulting budget, uh, if you remember last time, uh, we are about 5.1%. Uh, we have reduced the overall budget increase to 4.9. Uh, if you exclude the effect of debt on the budget, uh, the budget increase for ongoing operations is 2.86%. Any place where you see a, 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 a black, uh, you know, something that's been bolded or in a darker color, um, that's basically... Uh, what changes we've made since the last presentation. And the tax levy, um, you know, we were able to bring that tax levy down uh, under 2%. So it's at 1.9, 1 1 .9, including the due debt. You know, just from ongoing operations, the tax levy increases 1.54%. Once again, that's a fairly low number compared to what we've been seeing over the last few years. So once again, um, you know, we're basing the state aid on the executive governor or the uh, governor's executive budget proposal. Uh, I did hear today that the budget director had stated that because of increasing revenues at the state level and because of the federal stimulus money that New York State is going to receive, that any of the uh, reductions made in the governor's budget will uh, be eliminated. So we have yet to see what that means for Fayetteville Manlius, but we are encouraged that um, we may be getting some more money. But once again, we won't know that till April 1st. Um, and currently we are under the tax levy limit. You know, our tax levy limit is 2.13%. And as I mentioned before, we're at 1.9. So this slide here, as you can see, uh, we have not changed any numbers because uh, we have no new information. We're still looking at um, 
fairly sizable increase, but there are some concerns. And from what we understand, both the assembly and Senate versions of the budget uh, are rejecting the governor's proposal to uh, combine uh, different aid categories into the services aid. And uh, they're also rejecting the reduction uh, that's shown here as local district funding adjustment. Uh, they're also rejecting the governor's proposal on that. As for the tax OB limit, there's really three components that make that up this year. Uh, we've talked before about uh, consumer price index, which is at a fairly low 1.23%. Uh, we do see uh, a growth factor because of new brick and mortar growth within our district of uh, a little bit more than a half percent. And we're getting a little bit of a bump because of the capital exclusion. So once again, all of those combined together reflect a tax levy limit of 2.13%. However, because we uh, felt that we wanted to come down under 2%, we are um, unilaterally uh, looking at reducing that tax levy in increase to 1.9%. Give you some historical uh, background here, looking back at the last three years, uh, you can see what the tax levy increases were in the middle column. But the thing to note is that, you know, our tax rate, because our uh, we see growth in our tax base each year, the uh, tax rate um, actually in those three years were decreases. Um, for almost every town in the community uh, in the tax or in the school district, except for the town of Pompey, which is seeing some um, equalization changes that are impacting their tax rate. So once again, we're looking at a tax levy increase of 1.9 and conservatively, we're estimating that the tax rate will increase by 0.9%. So all the revenues, um, you know, we do budget these conservatively and there have been some changes from the last time. Uh, this next slide will show um, where those changes are. Uh, we did reduce our charges for services by a little bit. Uh, we also did um, <clears throat> reduce our admissions and fees and uh, also our Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement. Uh, these changes were made based upon how we're trending in the current year. Uh, we are hopeful that perhaps next year, getting back to a full five day uh, a week instruction, in-person instruction, that uh, some of these areas will bounce back, but we felt that it'd be more prudent to reflect the numbers that we think we're gonna get um, and make those changes here. Uh, we're also looking at a slight reduction in uh, prior year refunds. So as for the expenditure side of the budget, you know, once again, uh, this budget does include funding to support the district's strategic plan. I know there was a question earlier. Uh, there is money set aside uh, for uh, curriculum hours uh, related to uh, diversity uh, and equity and inclusion. Uh, there is some other funding that, you know, is set aside for each goal that either the Board of Education or administration uh, adopts for next year. Uh, we are expecting that staffing will be relatively the same as in the current year. Um, you know, once again, payroll is really dependent upon uh, collective bargaining agreements that are either in place or are currently being negotiated. And as I mentioned before, we are seeing some cost increases in health insurance and retirement system costs. Uh, we are increasing the amount of instructional uh, technology equipment purchases to kind of play catch up. We did have to spend a significant amount of money on Chromebooks in the current year. However, uh, what that meant was we had to put off some of our replacement plan uh, to the future. And so we had to increase the budget for next year to kind of play catch up on that replacement plan. And last but not least, uh, the new debt is really, uh, you know, uh, a main driver of uh, some of the budget increase for this next year. Uh, we did talk about breakage last time, which is simply, you know, the difference between uh, what we pay 
um, more experienced teachers that are uh, retiring uh, versus uh, new teachers that are replacing them. Uh, we are looking at health insurance premiums to be no more than a 5% increase, and that was finalized last week. The board did uh, adopt a 5% increase on premium for the, for uh, at least for the one year. Uh, dental and vision premiums appear to be not changing at all. Uh, we definitely know about dental, um, but uh, we're yet to hear about vision, but we anticipate no change in premium. Uh, workers' compensation is down, and you know we're hopeful that that trend will continue. Uh, you know the next two items: uh, the teachers' retirement system and employee retirement system. You can see there's a fairly uh, sizable increase in the employer contribution rate. Um, you know while this 9.53 to 9.8 doesn't look like a lot, um, it's still you know uh, about three three percent. Uh, on the employee retirement side, that's really representative of an 11% increase. So debt payments, um, you know, once again, uh, we're seeing debt increasing by $1.8 million, uh, most of which is related to bond anticipation notes to help us fund uh, the remaining Wellwood construction project. We are seeing a bit of a building aid increase. Uh, we are applying for early aid, uh, which is going to help uh, smooth the, uh, the tax levy uh, impact of the, uh, the new project coming on stream. So we are expecting an increase in building aid by 1.9 million in this next year. So when we look at the, uh, <clears throat> the next two slides are the instructional program. And when we look at this first slide, uh, you can see that there really wasn't any change from what we did uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we're still looking at, um, you know, and, and when we look at this, this slide, it's really specific to K-12 instruction, uh, regular education. And uh, we kind of break it down by, you know, the purpose, whether it's, uh, you know, salaries or equipment, instruction materials, or textbooks, et cetera. Um, but on the next slide, we actually look at uh, support areas. And we did make some minor changes here. Um, you can see that we made a change in special education. Uh, and once again, the reduction in special education is not due to reducing program in that area, uh, but simply that we have fewer high cost students in that area. Uh, fewer students that are attending BOCES programs, which typically run uh, over $100,000 or can run over $100,000. Um, we still have money in the special education budget uh, so that if we have any surprises by, you know, new students moving into our district that have uh, fairly costly um, IEPs that we would be able to handle that with the existing budget. Uh, we also made a minor change on transfer to special aid. Uh, typically, this is something that we trend how much money is being, um, you know, we only get a certain amount of special aid funding. Uh, these are really their title grants. So occasionally we'll have, um, you know, spending that will need to be transferred back into the general fund. And this reflects that uh, additional spending. The next slide, oh, one thing to mention before, uh, let me go back. I know last time there was a question about uh, percentages. Um, basically the, uh, the program budget uh, for the current year is 53.4% of the overall budget. Now that doesn't include benefits. We do know that the vast majority of the benefits is tied back to uh, employees on the, within the instructional program. Uh, but we break that out at least at this point and we combine it later on when we get into our, our budget hearing. Um, this year, uh, the program is decreasing to 51.9%, down about 1.5%. But that's strictly a function of the new debt. The new debt is uh, increasing the uh, capital portion of the budget significantly. So it's really reducing all the other areas of the budget when you're looking at it on a percentage basis. Uh, when we look at the uh, administration uh, expenditures, uh, once again, we only made one minor change here. 
and that's in the uh, public information central services. Um, this is kind of a hodgepodge. I mean, some of it is district-wide software, which we are making a purchase related to that. Uh, the other thing is we're breaking out, um, we actually get a tax bill, but we're exempt from property taxes. We do get a, a, a bill that's related to water and sewer, and that's incorporated in this line item for the first time. So that's $30,000 of that $49,000 increase. Uh, as for the administrative percentages, we are 6.5% in the current year, and we're at 6.4 next year, so it's pretty close. When we look at the capital budget, and here you can see that there is a substantial increase because of um, the new debt. Uh, we did slightly adjust our operations and maintenance, um, pretty much on discretionary spending related to uh, different types of maintenance projects and supplies. We still feel we have quite a bit of money in this area because quite a bit of it was restored in, uh, when you look at the budget change from year to year, you can see there's a significant increase because we're really restoring uh, the supplies that we needed. Uh, you know, going from uh, the filters that we used to use in our unit vents to the higher rated filters, whether they're MER 9 or MER 13, we basically doubled our cost of filters. It was an additional 50 grand just for uh, that one change alone. Uh, when you look at the uh, capital portion of the budget, it is going up uh, 2% as compared to the total, uh, going from 11.8% of the budget to 13.8. Uh, transfer to capital, we are keeping this the same amount at that $450,000 level. Once again, we're looking at um, repaving uh, the remainder of Pride Lane and uh, more carpet replacement at Enders Road. In order to make the Pride Lane paving aidable, we are gonna have to do something in the, in the building for at least $10,000. And we'll once again, be looking at something that's either safety or security related. Uh, this last slide with numbers is on the expenditure side of the budget is employee benefits. Uh, we did make some minor changes, just some fine tuning related to the teacher's retirement system cost. We went back and kind of took a hard look at that. And then we also looked at our health, dental and vision and also made a minor modification there. So uh, because we had reduced um, revenue, we had to reduce spending uh, slightly and we did accomplish getting under that, you know, 5% number uh, so we were at a five or a 4.9% increase, but once again, that's uh, mainly driven by the addition of new uh, debt from voter approved building projects. So what are we looking at in terms of upside uh, potential and downside risk? We still have yet to understand what the uh, New York state budget is going to do for us next year. We're hopeful or cautiously optimistic that we will get more money than what the governor's executive budget proposal was. So that would be good news. Um, we did hear uh, or saw in the paper that uh, Senator Schumer had stated that uh, $1.25 million of the federal stimulus money would be coming to FM. So uh, we'd have to you know, wait and see what the timing is of that. Um, once again, we're cautiously optimistic that we would get that money uh, in this next year. Uh, one thing to note is we're still awaiting for any of the money from the original $170,000 stimulus that was passed, um, what, last summer? Uh, we still have yet to see uh, any of that money. Uh, we have filed an application. Uh, that application approval is pending. Uh, we have heard that other districts have had theirs approved, um, but they haven't received any money either. So hopefully with the federal stimulus coming into the state, um, we'll, we'll see some of that money sooner than later. And we do know that we are seeing some budgetary savings in the current year. Um, you know, it's yet to be seen how much that will end up being at the end of the year. I know there's discussion later on this evening about, you know, returning uh, to more days of in-person instruction. And uh, we do have the funding uh, to accomplish that. 
um, but we'll have to you know wait and see how that pans out in terms of um, level of spending for the remainder of the year. But it should not be a problem. So just to summarize, um, you know we're seeing those expenditure increases that I've highlighted uh, in the past due to um, you know new debt primarily, but also increases in health insurance and retirement system costs. And of course we do have contractual salary increases as well. Um, not quite sure why that went out of order, but we are looking at a budget that's based on uh, the full return to five day uh, in-person instruction. We already know that uh, the original governor's proposal was heavily dependent upon federal stimulus. So we're hopeful that now that that's come through, uh, that will greatly help the state aid number. Mm -hmm. And, you know, finally, we're looking at a tax levy increase of 1.9% currently. And we feel that the resulting tax rate increase will be 0.9%. And, uh, you know, just once again, the stress, there's currently no plan to reduce any of the programs that we currently offer. There will be a separate proposition uh, once again this year to approve for the uh, uh, purchase of five replacement school buses. Uh, those buses are listed here. Uh, the total cost is a little bit more than the current year. Um, and after we annualize that cost over five years is basically we borrow the money to pay for the buses over five years. And we do that because the state pays us transportation aid over five years. Now, once you uh, <coughs> uh, take a look at the impact of uh, the purchase of those five buses, you can see that it's about $39,000 a year. So uh, looking at the future budget calendar, um, we do have the proposed budget presentation. You know, currently it's in preliminary form. Once we get the final state aid numbers, we will be able to uh, put together the proposed budget uh, for presentation and adoption by the full board on April 19th. I would imagine we would want to schedule a finance committee meeting prior to April 19th so that we can review the numbers with the finance committee. Uh, we do have a budget hearing scheduled for May 10th, and then the annual budget vote, which is the third Tuesday in May, is scheduled for May 18th this year. Are there any questions from the board? So, Bill, thank you very much. So, if I step back and take a look at the big picture, with everything we've been faced with this year, We've been able to continue with our program for the 1920 fiscal year. We anticipate we're gonna be able to continue with our program for the 2021 fiscal year. We are able to keep the tax levy below what is allowed by New York State, maintain our budget and continue on with our programs and the level of excellence going forward with the 2021 fiscal year. And I gotta say, I think, you know, providing uh, any new information that comes out with the 2021 budget, as far as the aid from the state, I think you've done an excellent job. And I think we continue to deliver to the community from a financial perspective, uh, an excellent budget going forward. Yeah, I would I would say that, um, you know, all the items you mentioned were really our budget goal as we started this process was we wanted to, uh, you know, maintain uh, the programs that we do offer. We wanted to do that in a, you know, we know that uh, people in the community um, may have suffered uh, economic hardship. So we were trying to keep the uh, you know the tax levy impact as low well as possible. 
which I think we uh, can check that off as well. Um, but I, I feel really comfortable where we are with this with this budget. Um, and you know, the only the only piece of the puzzle that's really missing is the state aid piece, and uh, we should know that within two weeks. Um, Bill, I was wondering if it would be, um, I think it might be helpful to advocate to our federal representatives about having the money sent directly to schools since we're still waiting for funds from last year, the, la the first stimulus. Um, I yeah, think, and I, have we done that? Have we reached out or? or well, I did hear. If we have, and I definitely think we should. I did hear uh, Senator Schumer in one of his um, uh, speeches where he was, you know, going around uh, talking about the federal stimulus money, that he did say that the money was going to go directly to schools. And I think he made the comment to the effect that he knows that Albany has sticky fingers. Yes. Uh, so, and that was quote unquote. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm very hopeful that we will see that money directly and that we will see it in a fairly timely manner. Um, by the numbers I saw that were posted on Syracuse.com, uh, it, it appears that once again, they're using the uh, Title I formula to uh, divvy up, you know, which districts get, you know, which amount of money, uh, which is a, a very equitable way in doing that. And, um, yeah, but once again, we are hopeful that, you know, we will get that funding. I would imagine uh, that uh, we would probably have to file some sort of application that as we spend the money, we are then going to have to file for, you know, um, reimbursement for those costs. That's typically what happens with any of the title grants. So I would envision that this would be very similar to that. Bill, Mark said it far better than I can, but as a taxpayer and a board member, I really appreciate what you and your team have done. Thank you. Well, thank you. And it is a team effort. There's there's a lot that goes into uh, the creation of this budget uh, from a payroll and benefit standpoint and from, you know, Cheryl and Lynn looking at revenues and expenditures and, and uh, you know, it, it is a team effort. So thank you, Daryl. So Bill, my question is actually not on numbers, but, but more process. Um, in, in terms of budget communications as we head toward another budget vote, have has there been any discussion about doing anything um, anything differently or in addition to how that's been done in the past or same essential plan as the past? Well, I think that you know anytime we can improve communication, we should you know take the opportunity to do that. I know we put out a preliminary uh, article uh, through the website. Um, you know, uh, about the budget for next year, you know, now that we've presented the uh, second pass of the preliminary budget, I think it's something we could post on the website, get another article out. Um, and I think, you know, the final uh, step is once we do get, you know, the state aid numbers, because right at that point in time is really when we have final, final numbers. And, uh, you know, you got to be careful putting out information too soon because it does change and you don't want it to change the wrong direction. So, um, you know, from the first preliminary budget to now this revised preliminary budget, everything went the right, the right direction. Um, but I think we have to take a hard look at, you know, what state aid numbers come out. Um, you know, what does that mean for us? Uh, and, you know, is there any other expenditures that, you know, we, we uh, are not anticipating right now that might come to pass. So, you know, I think there's, uh, there's always things that we need to be taking a look at. To me, the budget process is not just, you know, now through April or May. Uh, it's an all year thing. You know, uh, going back to September, we just take a hard look at, you know, we have our first month under us in terms of salaries for uh, teachers and, and other uh, staff members. So let's compare to our budget and see, you know, how were we? Uh, but once again, I think the budget process is really 12 months a year. And, and uh, but in direct answer to your question, I think that 
you know, whatever we can do to get more communication out. I know Dr. Tice and I are going to uh, do a video similar to last year. Uh, that video will be shared with um, multiple groups, every, everybody from faculty, um, HSAs, other, um, other groups where it's the uh, sports boosters. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of groups out there that we will get that, that share that video with. Um, we will also be doing some meetings uh, either by Zoom or in person uh, to, uh, you know, get the, get the word out on the budget. So uh, still a lot to be done, still a lot to uh, communicate, but, you know, I think now that we have a pretty solid budget, we can move forward with that. Did that answer your question there? Yeah, it does. And so just to piggyback on that, my, my concern is, is really pretty simple. Um, we obviously have a mixed perception in the community about how you know the current school year has been and some people have been satisfied with it and some people have been obviously very dissatisfied with it and there has been some chatter in the community that i just think is misplaced um where it basically consisting of well i'm not happy with how things have gone this year so i'm going to vote against any budget and i, I think that's so counterproductive that everybody wants all of our kids back in school and this budget plans for having everybody back in school and everything operating as it historically has pre pandemic and and to to vote against that as a form of protest over how this year has gone I, I think is very counterproductive because that only would then serve to hurt next year. And, and so I, I think really communicating out. Um, in, in some respect, the, the difference between, you know, what we're planning for versus what we've been doing this year and, and really truly the risks of, you know, what a contingency budget, for example, would do um, to the educational program uh, going forward is I, I just, I, I think there are some components of the community that may not be understanding what the true ramifications on the students would be of doing that. What do we agree? Any additional questions or comments in regards to the budget? I can only see a portion of the board right now, so I uh, think we're good. All right, thank you again, uh, Mr. Furlong. Excellent job, appreciate it. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda, item 2.01, the president's report. So I wanted to start, the board wanted to recognize the heightened racial violence and discrimination that is facing Asian Americans at this point in, um, in time. Um, we want to let the, our students and our community know that we support our Asian American families and students. Um, we're not aware of any incidents occurring in the district, but we did feel it was important to acknowledge what is happening in the world because we know that that can have a serious um, emotional impact on our students. And we want them to know that it's our goal to provide a safe space for all of our students, including our Asian American students. So the board wanted uh, me to express that on their behalf. Um, second, I wanted to thank all the teachers who have reached out to the Board of Education, either um, with email or with um, calls um, in regards to our reopening plans. Our, our teachers um, have shared with the board, um, of course, their concerns for supporting our students in the best manner possible. Uh, we have asked a great deal of our teachers um, this year, and they have risen to the occasion. It's been a year where I think a lot of teachers have developed technology skills that they did not even think they ever would need to use. Um, our teachers have shared what it's like to be in the classroom managing multiple cohorts. They have expressed concerns about students and how best to support them in these trying circumstances developmentally and socially and um, in terms of education. Um, they have shared with the board um, their I ideas about how um, to support our remote cohort or virtual students to ensure equity for that cohort. So 
So this year, this week, there are going to be meetings in the district where teachers will have input into um, how we bring our, our elementary students back. So I think that's very helpful and will be um, a really good pro um, process moving forward for um, our teachers to um, share their thoughts as we make um, decisions. So thank you again to all the teachers who wrote and, and called. It was very much appreciated. The board does know that it is trying. They are, these are very trying times for you. Um, and it was really um, helpful for me personally to hear about, um, just be able to visualize what's happening in the classrooms because there are a lot of things that um, even I as a teacher would not uh, imagine because I don't teach cohorts and I just have a remote cohort of students. So thank you very much. Marissa, um, I just like to thank you and also compliment you on your timely responses to both parents and grandparents and most especially to our teachers our highly overworked teachers um, who've reached out to us in the last week or two. Um, it's just so important that people be heard and you've certainly done that. You've listened and you've heard them. So thank you on behalf of myself and I hope the board. Thank you, Daryl. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, finally, I wanted to mention um, some programs that I was really excited to hear about OCMBOCES. So we've talked a lot about um, at the board level about um, programs for kids who may not be planning on going to college, um, programs that prepare kids for work right after high school. And I would really encourage everyone to go to the OCMBOCI website. They have some excellent embedded programs for students. There's one at Tracy Road for heavy equipment. Um, it's a heavy equipment operator program. As students are at Tracy Road for either the morning or the afternoon working on um, equipment and the um, owners of um, Tracy Road have given advice to OC and BOCES about particular skills that they're looking for in future employees. So those can be incorporated into the curriculum. Um, that program, I believe, just started this year. So they have a group of juniors. The next year will be juniors and seniors. There's also an embedded program at um, SUNY Upstate for students who are interested in physical therapy. There's one at WCNY for media marketing and communications. And there is an automotive technology program at Driver's Village. And these are all really outstanding programs for students to go half a day and to learn skills where they can go right into employment, entry-level employment after um, high school or to prepare them for um, additional training in different fields. But I just thought those are really great programs and really speak to um, students who may who may be interested to interesting to students who plan not to go to college but really want to get into some some excellent career opportunities. So I just wanted to mention that as something um, that's going on at both these. Um, that concludes my report. I'll turn it over to Dr. Teich for his COVID nineteen update. Thank you, uh, President Mims. Uh, I would certainly um, want to provide everybody with uh, an update uh, today about COVID. Uh, you know that weighs heavily on everybody's uh, minds, including the teachers who took an opportunity to write to us, as well as uh, family members and community members. So under internal operations, as you may be aware, the Onondaga County Health Department issued an extended policy proposal on March 16th to augment uh, what was originally released on March 4th. The language in the extended proposal specifically addresses recommendations for the implementation of the proposed policy with respect to food service and transportation, and that was very important uh, for us. In fact, during this afternoon's press briefing, the Onondaga County Executive, Ryan McMahon, stated that the Onondaga County Health Department will adopt the recent CDC guidelines of three feet without a barrier for students to return to school. Under community relations, as mentioned before, Onondaga County has graciously agreed to provide the desk barrier sneeze guards to all school districts. The first set of elementary barriers have arrived at the receiving facility at Onondaga County and the remainder are on back order. School maintenance and custodial crew, crews will pick up the barriers and begin installation over the spring break. Even though the county executive said what he did today, we will still need the barriers at the elementary level where students will use them when they eat lunch in their respective classrooms. 
Under administration and preparation for the Onondaga County Health Department policy proposal, school district administrators, uh, or excuse me, school district officials administered a faculty staff survey and a family questionnaire. So at this time, I'll now provide a summary of the results of that family questionnaire and staff survey. If I could impose on our district clerk to call that up at this time. Certainly. If you'll click into the next uh, couple slides, I don't know if I have, if you've got control. I'd like to go over the district data at this time. The first slide, as you can see here, uh, is generally uh, the responses from all of our families. We had uh, over 2,000 official responses, as you can see, uh, approximately or exactly 481, uh, approximately, as you can see there, 23.1% uh, wanted to begin with four days of instruction and transition to five days. Uh, we had a few more uh, in terms of return to five days, about 36.5%. And then finally, uh, the majority at 841 return to four days. But we wanted to dig down into the data a little bit deeper. Next slide, please. So taking a look at the different levels under kindergarten through fourth grade, we see that uh, the pie chart, uh, the lion's share is the return for five days at 46.6%, followed up by a return to four days at 31%, and to begin with four days before transitioning uh, to five days at 22.4%. And you can see the actual numbers there of the 772 responses. So a slight tilt uh, to the five days at the elementary level. Next slide, please. At the middle school level, we see it uh, pretty even there. About 40% return to five days, about 39.3% return to four days, and only about 20.7% in terms of adding an extra transition in. So it is pretty evenly split at grades five through eight. To see the shift continue, if you go through nine through 12, you can see overwhelmingly at 52.6% of our families want to return to four days. At 21.1, return to five days, which is actually less than the families that were looking for a transition beginning with four days, switching to five days at 26.3%. Next slide, please. So as you can see, uh, there were a number of families involved split up. Uh, again, there were multiple children. So uh, I am pretty proud of these results. I'm thankful for the community for weighing in of about 4,250 students. There were 3,359 represented among the six buildings. Thank you, next slide. One of the other questions asked uh, in terms of uh, remote instruction or in-person instruction. As you know, we began the year with about 85% of our students for in-person instruction. About 15% were in remote. We saw those numbers surge around the holidays as people were worried about uh, post-holiday surges for Thanksgiving and then around the December holidays. So believe it or not, at the secondary level, uh, the numbers in remote instruction spiked to about 20 to 25%. Since then, and as things have subsided a little bit in the pandemic and people are feeling a little bit more comfortable, we can see that even now with this survey that 93%, so even exceeding the numbers that we started September with, are ready to return the children to in-person instruction with only about 6.2% uh, at the remote level. Next slide, please. As far as bus transportation, a uh, little over 50%, 55.4 will require uh, bus transportation versus not. We appreciate the families uh, helping to transport the children this year. As you know, our buses have been limited to about one student per seat unless they come from the same household. Siblings, relatives can sit together from the same household, but it certainly limits uh, what we're able to do. With the new extended guidance that was released, uh, it'll be very important for the uh, last 15 minutes inbound to school and the first 15 minutes outbound in terms of fitting additional students on the bus 
So we needed to have a firm number on this going forward. So now we go into the building data where you can see a little bit more of the specific work. At the high school, uh, again, these are just the respondents. Uh, we drilled down a little bit more. The building level administrators have called home. But you can see from the original survey, uh, there are only about 78 interested in the remote instruction as compared to the lion's share ready to return. Next slide. Eagle Hill Middle School at 28 in remote instruction. Wellwood 44 in remote. And then this is what is really interesting for the elementary buildings. And again, the administrators have called uh, home to verify these numbers. We wanna make sure we get as many into the remote as possible uh, in terms of planning purposes, about 30 uh, for remote at Fayetteville Elementary. Ender's Road, believe it or not, 16, that uh, crept up a little bit as well since the survey has been completed. And then finally, Mott Road, only about 12, and that moved up, I believe, to 21. I had a chance to speak with the principal today. So the numbers are very uh, limited at the elementary level for remote instruction. And then last slide, uh, the staff surveys. We had a chance to survey the staff about their preference, not only in terms of the number of days, but some of the challenges that they felt and some of the potential solutions. And this included all stakeholder groups, uh, from faculty uh, to support staff and administrators throughout the entire organization to get the feedback. And as you can see here, overwhelmingly uh, wanting to return to four days of in-person instruction uh, with limited numbers uh, for the other two choices. So what does this mean going forward? If you'll close out of that, thank you. Uh, going forward, uh, certainly in non-instructional business, it pays, it's a lot of work for our transportation department. So I wanna thank them for reworking the schedules in order to accommodate the students who will need transportation in this expanded model. And as I mentioned, the first 15 minutes outbound and last 15 minutes inbound will be very important and that siblings and relatives, as I said, will be able to sit together. We do think we will be able to do it uh, without uh, doubling up on some of the routes. Under personnel, it's important to remember that the teachers will continue to work with multiple cohorts under the revised plan. And that's really uh, what I think is going to take place over the next uh, week. As you might expect, when balancing the needs of two groups instead of three in the hybrid model, Faculty will still need time to work with the in-person and remote cohorts, either synchronously or asynchronously. So to that end, the district may need to hire additional support, and that's what the teachers and building administrators are working through right now, is what that additional support looks like. Under a normal year, I know, I, I know our families are chopping at the bit to get started. We heard that tonight in public comment. But what is atypical for us during this pandemic is the fact that the teachers really are uh, working hard to juggle multiple cohorts. So it could be uh, that we provide that additional support uh, during the day uh, to work with the classroom teachers or that the uh, additional support could come in the form of working uh, with the remote cohorts. Uh, we may as a district have to hire additional teacher aides and teaching assistants to help with supervision, the delivery of school lunches at the elementary level, as well as instructional support. Food service department, as you've heard me say earlier, will need to recall furloughed workers and our transportation department, in spite of reworking the routing, will still have to adjust their schedules to deliver print materials to the remote cohorts. Under students, we will have to ask families uh, to transfer the responsibility for the thermal scans to the family unit. All families will re be required to administer the daily temperature screenings at home and to answer the requisite COVID symptom questionnaire on the weekly basis in order to lessen the burden on school district staff as we supervise the return of uh, more students. And please know that all non-pharmacological interventions will continue to be used, such as face covering, social distancing, and the washing of hands. In fact, lockers and cubbies will still not be used, and classroom windows will be open to allow for proper ventilation as spring weather approaches. And then finally, as I indicated earlier, our elementary teachers will be meeting this week in order to decide how best to deploy the instructional support. 
including but not limited to options, which may be uh, in terms of adding the additional support into the classroom, uh, which would give the teachers release time in order to work with synchronous and asynchronous instruction, especially with the online virtual students, or whether we will use that instructional support for a long-term substitute teacher that will be hired to work explicitly with the remote cohort of students. And that's one of the reasons, as the board knows, that we're targeting April 19th. Even though families would like things to return earlier, we're targeting uh, the 19th in the event that the teachers and building administrators work together and choose to hire a remote teacher uh, to work with the students for the last quarter. So that will help in closing out the grade books uh, for the third quarter and beginning the fourth quarter. So that is an update on where we are now. Uh, I will ask the board later tonight to adopt the expanded model uh, offered by Onondaga County. We will get the barriers, as I said, uh, even though we're no longer need them uh, for instruction uh, and hopefully not have the uh, secondary students have to cart them around from class to class. We still will use the barriers at the elementary level, especially for food service operations as the students will continue to eat in their elementary classroom. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, we're still awaiting to hear back from the uh, committees that are working at the elementary building level. But as of now, we're looking at a five-day return uh, at the elementary level and a four-day return in grades five through 12. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tice. And can we make sure that that parent survey is sent out to um, teachers and made available so that people, I don't know if you want to put on the website or where, but I think it should be available so that people can can, can see that and look through that. Um, so in terms of, um, one concern that I heard is about how the um, the rooms are set up, are going to be set up for students and and the fact that our the younger students are not going to be able to move around as much. You know, they're losing their, their time, um, their time on their mats. They have sometimes, some of them have little desks that they use. And they're also using the, losing a lot of their autonomy in the classroom, being able to get their own supplies and do that. So I, I think in, when you talk about instructional support, is that, does that include, I, well, I would hope it would, looking at how to support the mental and, and, and social well-being of these kids? Because um, I think there is, is going to be a big shift for kids to go for two to four days, especially in these circumstances. And as the weather gets warmer, wearing those masks and not having air conditioning. So it's going to be a lot on these kids for nine, nine weeks. So can you talk about how that piece is going to be addressed? Uh, that is something we have talked about in terms of, uh, you're right, it is going to be a little bit more crowded, but we're anxious to work a lot of this out in anticipation of September and getting ready for the start of the new school year. So certainly additional instructional support, as I indicated, aids and teaching assistance to provide uh, additional supervision or to transport the meals uh, from the cafeteria kitchen uh, to the classrooms at the elementary level will be important. Uh, for, you're right, for grades five through 12, it will be additional students uh, back as opposed to the hybrid model, uh, but uh, many of them, as you know, are now taking full advantage of the enrichment and activity periods, the extra help that our secondary teachers have been offering, as well as extracurricular clubs and activities, as well as interscholastic sports. So in some ways, as I talked to the board probably what, two, three months ago, we're starting with the baby steps, kind of crawling before we're walking, and then hopefully we'll hit September running. Did any of the changes at the county, I didn't get a chance to read the whole um, article, but there were concerns about the music program and we sent a letter to the state commissioner advocating on their behalf. Do any of these changes affect how the music program can operate? In the extended uh, document, uh, there is a reference to that. That's the one item that uh, they're still struggling with. Uh, it's, we're kind of on our own for that, but uh, in terms of using a barrier at six feet. Originally, as you know, the guidance was to be at 12 feet uh, for that. But they have, for physical education, they've dropped it from 12 feet to six feet. And then, as you know, for classroom instruction, uh, they've dropped it to three feet now without a barrier. It's on page six of uh, the document. 
So there is competing language between state ed and the Department of Health. And six feet is being used uh, nationally. The New York State Department of Health is asking for 12 feet uh, for students music and singing during the school day. We have dropped it to six feet for after hours, extracurriculars, groups uh, with parental permission, much like we're doing for interscholastic athletics. Any uh, other questions for the board? I have other ones, but I don't want to keep going so everyone can chime in. Sherry? So, oh. Oops, Mark and Sherry. Go ahead, go ahead Sherry. All right. I actually just want to pick up, piggyback on Marissa's a little bit about the elementary. Uh, you mentioned the changes in terms of uh, the spacing and the amount of movement the kids get. Uh, Dr. Tice, you said one of the options is having a, a, a instructional helper or a, a permanent substitute position. Um, and I know from my experience of being a teacher that planning for a substitute is just as hard as being there. So um, I just want to make sure that that is being discussed and be, being emphasized that the idea of having a sub in the room one day a week, it means that the teachers have to plan for that day. And I don't think that's what they're, uh, they're looking for in terms of uh, being able to handle a cohort C and all of the extra planning we have to do with all, with with uh, with the keeping up with the COVID regulations. And I agree. I think that's why they're looking at it. I mean, keep in mind we're still operating with five instructional days. So even though Wednesdays has been asynchronous, the teachers have still had to plan for that fifth day as well. So that's why we're looking at hiring teachers for that instructional support, whether it's to work with the remote group only or to help within the classroom. They would be associate teachers to be able to roll up their sleeves and help out directly. So it wouldn't necessarily all fall into the lap of the classroom teacher. Thank you. Thank you. So if I could add, I don't think King Solomon had it so good as he only had to deal with two mothers. So we have like multi uh, entities, if you will, or um, groups, no less than six or probably seven or eight. And we've had to deal with each and every one and we've listened to each and every one. And I gotta say personally, I've spent sleepless nights trying to make sure that I understand each and every group. And I'm sure each and every board member has done the same thing. So I've got a feel that our administration and board has done the best to try to gain a path that adheres to what is best for each and every member of the, each and of each of these constituencies. So I gotta say, I'm wholeheartedly behind whatever we decide as a group to determine what is best for our community. And so I, I don't know what the best solution is and I don't think there's a perfect solution, but I think moving forward, what you have proposed is what we have to try as a community. And so I'm ready to move forward with this decision and whatever decision you propose and let's give it a shot. I appreciate that. I mean, there are things that we would like to work out before the new school year approaches. I think a lot of us were surprised the start with four, move to five, wasn't selected more I know neighboring districts are trying that out. Uh, the feeling here was that it just, you know, introduces another transition into an already complex situation. So I do think taking a look at it from kindergarten through 12, realizing that one size does not fit all, trying to meet the needs of our youngest learners, at the same time uh, providing the opportunities for our oldest learners 
uh, in, in making things like extracurriculars, interscholastic sports, extra help, all possibilities. I think you're right, it balances it, but you're right, it's not a one size fits all approach. It's trying to look at it big picture. And what I'm anxious for is to hear from the teachers. I know we've heard from them in a variety of reasons, but I think having them get together for consensus uh, will be very important as well. So Craig, one, one part that I guess I'm, I'm just not fully clear on is when we were originally told the April 19 date, it was because we were of the belief that we needed barriers and you said you didn't want to over promise under deliver and delivery times and installation times and all of that. And I know this is very new news, but very good news that the barriers are no longer required. So is there any room or opportunity to move that timetable up at all? Based on the conversations that the teachers are having this week, if they elect to have the in-class support, meaning the teacher of record wouldn't change, there's a possibility that uh, that date could move up if people are excited to move it up. But at the same time, if the students are going to a remote teacher for the last quarter of the year, I think that April 19th date has to hold. Right, and then my follow-up question is exactly on that. And, and that's the concern for, for those who are currently in cohort C and are choosing to remain in the remote cohort. Um, you know, our teachers, even remotely, have done an incredible job with an incredible amount of hours trying to build bonds with their students. And those bonds between the students and the teachers, particularly at the elementary level with our youngest learners, are, are so vital to the educational process that I, I'm really concerned about the prospect of them having to have a new teacher for the fourth quarter of the year and start over with somebody new. And, and I don't know if anybody who chose that option, you know, they were all asked to give a commitment. I don't know that any of them knew or even conceived that part of that decision would be their child having to start over again with a new teacher for the fourth quarter of the year. So, you know, I don't know where those discussions are um, but but I would think that the the input of the teachers, particularly at the K four level, who have worked so hard to build those bonds, would be paramount in that decision making process of how that piece goes forward, uh, because they know better than anybody what breaking those bonds right now would 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 do and have as an impact on the children. So I'm I'm just very concerned about that notion of of those bonds being broken for just one quarter of the year. And you're absolutely right, Dan. It has to be with the teachers and that's what's taking place this week as we speak. Uh, we certainly value their opinion and are trying to get a handle on that. And then depending if the remote option is selected, as you alluded to, the building principals are prepared during the vacation period to be calling home to those families. It represents 103 children among all three buildings. So uh, the percentage is, is very low uh, for that, about two and a half percent. And so I think it's important for us to call home to lay everything out for those parents. Uh, the feeling is that some of those 103 may end up returning to the classroom. That being said, I'm happy and pleased to have been working with union stewardship for the teachers, along with Mr. Gordon and certainly wanting and you know everyone advocating for the teachers to have a say in it. But at the same time, uh, the administration agreed to continue the stipend that was part of a memorandum of agreement uh, that Mr. Gordon was able to work through. And we're going to keep that in effect for the remainder of the year. If you remember the stipend was uh, a nominal amount to acknowledge the hard work of the teachers with the remote group but that being said, is there a way to still include those students in a morning meeting, for example, checking in at the beginning of the day or end of the day? And then also uh, in the event that a quarantine comes up, I mean, we're still in the middle of a pandemic and I think sometimes people forget that. So even the in-person 
sections may still find themselves on quarantine depending on how this all sorts out. So uh, we decided as an administration along with the FMTA stewardship to continue that stipend going forward. Again, because of all the variables that we do not know we will be dealing with in the fourth quarter. So we still want those students to be connected at the same time, but we also need to make it uh, efficient in terms of working with those families that prefer to stay at home, but making it manageable for our teachers now to deal with twice as many students in the classroom. We're trying to find a win-win. You're right. No, I, and, I, and I get that. So you just touched on the quarantine part and that's, that's sort of the other piece to, if we went to teachers who strictly handled the remote part and, and did break those bonds is during quarantines to this point this year, students still stayed with their teachers. They just essentially went to cohort C during the duration of their quarantine and came back. If we went away from that model, then when students are quarantined, they would be switching teachers if they remained with continued remote learning. Is that not correct? Yes and no, probably not. They would stay with the in-person teacher and we would have to work that out. So that'll be part of the conversations this week. They would not necessarily switch to the remote teacher. But again, again, those details are being worked out this week. Okay. Craig, I, I think we should wait until the elementary teachers have had a chance to weigh in and discuss. And certainly in an ideal world, we'd hate to see those bonds broken, but in the real world, we have teachers going out for surgery, teachers going out for maternity leave, and those children will rebond. I just think we have to be fair to the teachers who have really worked triple time all year long. So I'll be anxious to hear how they weigh in. I totally agree, Daryl. I mean, that um, that happens, you're right, pre-pandemic and it'll happen again post-pandemic in terms of working with different teachers. Craig, do Tom I'm sorry. Uh, no, go ahead. You haven't asked a question yet. Go ahead. Um, I guess just piggybacking on that, you know, cohort C potential new teacher, what, and obviously I know the teachers are going to meet to walk through this, but I mean, what are the, what are the options in terms of who that teacher would be? Is that someone new that we'd bring in as a long-term sub, or is that a like one teacher out of, let's say there's five in a, you know, in a, in a level kindergarten, first grade, would we assign one of those teachers to be the cohort C teacher? And just, if you could just talk a little about maybe what some of the options are there. Right now, uh, some teachers do not have any cohort C and Mr. Gordon can jump in here as well. We do not envision assigning any current teachers to the remote group. It would be uh, substitutes, uh, retirees, that have already uh, been approved. If they haven't been approved, uh, Mr. Gordon's put uh, an advertisement out. We might have to call a special board meeting uh, prior uh, to get them appointed. Uh, they would have to be tech savvy, I would think, in terms of dealing with the remote uh, cohort. Uh, but we do think uh, we have a lot of options at our disposal. I know there's been certain names bandied about, and I think that uh, would give us options going forward. Mr. Gordon, is there? No, other, hi, hi Kelly. Uh, other than to say that, um, that uh, I think Dr. Tice said it, but just to be clear, based on the data that we received from the parents, the numbers in each classroom are so low after the switch that to take one of those teachers away from there, you're talking about zero to I think the highest was three or four, but most of them were zero or one uh, student in the class that was still a C student. So to take that teacher away from the other 19 or 20 kids seems the wrong way to approach this. Uh, yeah, I guess I was thinking more like across like the grade level, you know, if you compiled all of this cohort C students, am I explaining that right? Or <laughs> still look, not looking at it the right way? There, you know there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of options and there are probably more that the teachers are gonna come up with. So I think obviously as, as Daryl may have mentioned, I think it's really important that I know everybody wants to know the answers, but I think that we've come up with a couple of examples, but that's, they're, just, they're just examples. Um, we think the teachers hopefully will be able to come up with you know, either tell us what they like and don't like about each of those or or help uh, craft a new model completely. But, um, but generally across the district, 
the numbers are so low in each building by grade level that you couldn't even to pull one of those teachers and try to reassign, you'd have somebody new in that other classroom then. So um, that hasn't been discussed, but again, anything is on the table uh, as long as the teachers are involved in helping make that, those yeah. informed judgments. Yeah, I think I'm just I'm trying to wrap my head around, you know, the, the difference between a four day and a five day and what the trade-offs are. And, you know, and I'm just, I'm struggling a little bit with the, is it worth going to five days um, even at the elementary school level? But so, but I want to listen more. Sherry? Uh, you, <laughs> my question is not more on what Kelly wanted to hear, but I actually want to jump a little bit to our middle school and high school, just in that uh, I assume the numbers are going to make it so there may be, it may have to, well, I guess the question is, do the numbers make it so that uh, schedule readjustments will have to occur that uh, we'll see middle school and high school uh, administrators and guidance counselors having to redo people's schedules or are the numbers going to remain where they are are and classes can happen the way they would but just in person for 40 days my understanding in talking at the high school level with dr kilmer they may have to reassign some rooms whether it's breaking up study halls uh, to smaller rooms versus one larger room, but certainly they're taking into account the square feet in each of the rooms. So my understanding is that the schedules are not going to be impacted and if they are only slightly. Good to hear. So it's it's mostly, mostly large group sessions being divided up into smaller sessions. That's good to hear, thank you. Study hall. Dr. Tice, um, so in terms of a timeline, so the meet, there are meetings that are taking place this week to get the teacher input into whether it's the remote teacher or the instructional support and what, and then what that instructional support would look like if, if teachers chose that particular model. But can you give us sort of a timeline as far as teachers want to plan, parents want to plan, as far as when like when do, you, when do you anticipate having the information from the teachers and how are you going to tabulate all that? I don't envy that process, to, you know, so that it's a transparent process and people feel like, you know, I understand how we arrived at this decision and I feel like I was heard. So what is the timeline so that people can start planning to implement this and parents will know exactly what's gonna happen to the kids and everybody? The meetings are going to be held this week, uh, as my understanding. Dr. Coughlin can jump in here as well. As I said, the, if the remote model is selected, the building principals will have to uh, call home to the remote cohort C to let them know of the change of the teacher for that section. Uh, we will have to hire those teachers, so another board meeting may be needed uh, sometime either over the break or the week of the 5th. And again, it depends what choices the teachers make. Right now, I think the 19th holds until we hear what the final decisions are from the teachers, whether it can be moved up or if it stays is the 19th for the fourth quarter switch. I would just add that, as Dr. Tice said, there are small group um, meetings happening this week. And then we have a representative group of teachers that will meet later in the week. Uh, ideally, um, it would be helpful if teachers had an opportunity going into break, what sort of structure we were looking at, so they can start to wrap their heads around that. Um, in addition to the instructional support, there are a lot of other considerations and logistics to work out. You've mentioned some of them, um, space in the rooms, uh, music class, physical education class, students going to the laboratories. Um, so there are all sorts of procedures and processes that need to be worked out in addition to the instructional model. Um, so while April 19th seems like a long ways away, um, there's a lot to do. And um, But as I said, ideally we would have some idea of structure going into spring break for the teacher's benefit. So Craig, I, I just want to understand, I understand in the elementary school level, obviously the, the discussions that are having, 
But at the middle school and at the high school level, it doesn't seem like we have those same challenges, right? Because they're going to be four days a week and the students are already four days a week now, right? Correct. It would be merging the two hybrids, you know, theoretically. Right. Yeah. Yep. So where I'm going with that is, is that what's the obstacle at the high school and the middle school levels to bring them back before the 19th, right? Because the big thing was, was the partitions and now that's out. And I know you've got to work through all the transportation, but is there anything we can do to look at the week of the 12th and bring them a week earlier if we don't have these logistical things that we've got to figure out in the elementary schools? That's a good question. I can talk it over uh, with the team. I mean, uh, certainly that's a possibility. Uh, one of the reasons that we're having difficulty going to five days is, you know, we've been very protective of all the electives uh, in terms of being able to offer that. So when we come out of this post pandemic that we're still able to offer our AP and honors classes. So uh, it would be very difficult to provide the additional support to go to five days there, but we could conceivably start that earlier. We could, we could bring them in earlier now that the partitions are not needed. Okay. Thanks, Craig. So Dr. Tice, when you're talking about, when I asked the question about the timeline for reopening, I didn't mean to suggest that this was in any way in, in you know, stopping things from moving slowly because I do think it's an excellent process that we're following this week. So I, I wouldn't want the community either to think that, you know, because we're seeking input from teachers and following this process, is, that that's somehow slowing down our middle, or sorry, our elementary schools from reopening, because that's not at all the case. This is a very effective planning process that we're going to be going into. So I just wanted to make sure that um, I was clear on that point. Um, about reopening the schools. And also in terms of um, why the, the April 19th um, time, I do seem to recall there was some discussion about because of April break, and anecdotally, I think a lot of folks are gonna be traveling. I think there was some concern about um, having that, that two weeks would, um, would actually be helpful in terms of if there was a spike after people return from April break. I'm not sure how much of a concern that is with the way rates are low, but if people are traveling out of state, especially to Florida, that may be a concern. And that was, as you know, one of the things we heard following Thanksgiving and then following New Year's in terms of uh, taking a look at any potential post-holiday surge as well. So you're right, the 19th also took into account that as well. Craig, um I guess two things. One is I'm just very much looking forward to a uh, briefing on kind of the upshot of these meetings this week. And the, our teachers and building principals are experts on what this looks like, particularly this year. So um, we'll very much defer to what they think is best for the students and the teachers. Um, as well, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about equity for our students. Um, I know that our rationale this year has been to keep things consistent K to 12. And I'm just wondering if you can kind of talk about the different building levels and your your rationale behind that decision to, to change to make things different. Uh, great question. I think it is about providing opportunities. Uh, nobody is questioning that teachers kindergarten through 12th grade are all working uh, diligently. They're managing multiple cohorts. A lot is being asked of them. So I think as we look at this plan going forward, uh, we divided the cohort, cohorts up for the hybrid, as you know, based on equity in terms of uh, time in the classroom. And I know some people wanted more, but to be able to give some students two days a week from kindergarten through 12th grade, I think we sent a message or they sent a message to us that no one grade level was expendable at the cost of another. But now, as you know, as we get into uh, the January decision to open up interscholastic sports, our own decision to open up extracurricular activities, whether it's the performing arts, being able to offer extra uh, curricular clubs, as well as extra help after school during activity and enrichment, it does seem like it's uh, in terms of opportunities that uh, there are more opportunities at the fifth through 12th grade level. That being said, we started the blast-offs uh, program at the kindergarten through fourth grade level. 
And so while the time may be, have been our decision-making point for equity in September, this really is about opportunities going forward and finishing the year strong, learning about what we can and cannot do going into September. Uh, I assume that uh, the pandemic will still be going uh, on and we'll still have some residual, whether it's masks or hand sanitizer or not using lockers or cubbies but I think we can learn a lot in this opportunity going forward. So I think it's a learning opportunity for the district. It's making opportunities for the students. I know it isn't symmetrical and that has some people uh, you know, frustrated that there isn't equity, but I think if you look at it from the student perspective, all that we're doing five through 12 and trying to replicate that K through four in terms of the five days a week, especially with our younger students. I know it's in sync with what we've heard a lot from our families. I think it tries to find the win-win scenario and what has been an impossible year, as you know, uh, with this pandemic. As, as fun as this year has been, and I mean that sarcastically, uh, really it gives us a chance. I don't wanna wait all summer to find out what Labor Day is gonna look like. I wanna try some things out now uh, we're not going to be heavy handed. I'm depending on the teachers. I'm depending on the administrators, the support staff. We're going to learn things in transportation and food service by getting more kids back in the saddle. So I am very excited about what the potential is here in terms of finishing strong and providing opportunities. And again, not just for the children, but providing opportunities for district personnel at all levels, all unions, all stakeholder groups to learn what we have to do. We've said we've wanted input all along. Here's a chance to learn on the job training what things we can and cannot do going into September. I do not want to wait till Labor Day to have to sort things out, you know, at the beginning of a year. Craig, I have a question about in thinking of, you know, the K to four returning five days a week. I imagine, and you know, probably not just K to four, um, but you know, kids being excited to be back and seeing kids that they haven't seen in person or anxious or any number of things. And I imagine, you know, certainly for at least a little while, that's gonna present some challenges in terms of classroom management. And, you know, what I would hate, and I would think everyone would hate to see this turn into is a mass, um, you know, disciplinary action that needs to happen where kids are sent to an administrator's office, understanding that, you know, a lot of this is just going to be pent up energy and nothing, you know, purposefully disruptive. So, you know, I guess I want, I'm looking for assurance that, you know, our school counselors are going to be involved in whatever plans there are, you know, that everyone comes up with to come back that there'll be, you know, resources available to help the kids in this transition and that, you know, kids who end up being disruptive again for not, not purposefully, but just because they're kids, that this doesn't turn into a frustrating situation where teachers are trying to do the best they can teaching and keeping kids socially distant and kids just trying to be kids, um, you know, at least in the beginning, I, as I imagine, it's, it's difficult to adapt. Well, I think, you know, in terms of being a trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive school, we've begun our initial work in that area, and certainly the mental health aspect, you're right, is very important and on our minds. And at the same time, we know the children, the students have risen to the occasion, whether it's wearing masks and all the, the protocols that we've asked them to do with you know, lines in the hallways or one-way stairwells and uh, they've been very supportive through this. So in many ways, you're right, we're all in this together. Um, I, you know, every incident is taken on its own, but if there's some background there and you're right, we can get the support through a counselor, uh, we certainly can do that. But at the same time, we're all depending on each other in terms of doing the right thing. And we're still in the middle of a pandemic. And I think people are going to have to remember that even though we're trying to come back in person, this is still part of a grand experiment to see if we can do it. As you know, the Onondaga County Health Department has said that they will pull the plug on all of this if there's local surges either within the school, within the 
local community or geographic region uh, that, you know, they reserve the right to force not just Fayetteville Manlius, but all districts to go back into the hybrid model. So we're still in all of all this together. You're right, things may happen, but at the same time, we're still dependent on each other going forward. So Craig, just to piggyback on what Jason was talking about, these all these meetings and discussions and model debates are, are really focused at the elementary level. So we don't have another meeting scheduled until April 19th. Um, if, if there is to be some review or consideration as to whether middle or high school can go back to four day a week, maintaining the current cohort C, uh, model what what would be the process what would be the time frame and in, in in working toward that we i'd still want to take it back to the team to talk everything through it's still dependent on transportation food service i mean certainly that this is a multifaceted plan so the 19th may is still definitely the target but we can take a look at what we can conceivably move up i mean there's just so much in play right now. I don't want to get out ahead of it. I mean, if it's possible, I'm not going to slow it down on purpose, but I don't want to promise something we cannot deliver. And then my other question is on the opposite end of the scale. If, if these meetings at the elementary level, and again, it's hypothetical, and I look forward to hearing what, what, what the teachers have to say. I mean, this, this falls on them, and that's where the work falls. But, but if, if those meetings really flush out a consensus view that they wanted to stay with the same cohort model, but do it on a four day in person basis. Is that something that's just off the table to them? Is this a hard commitment to five days at K-12, at K-4? Or is, is there any room for discussion on four day and keeping the same cohort C model? I think there's always room for discussion. Everything is negotiable in terms of going forward, but at the same time, I have to advocate for the parents who, based on the data, said that they need the children back. And our youngest learners, as we know, uh, at the early grade levels, they learn to read, and then, you know, as they get older, they read to learn. And I just know that there are a lot of teachers we've heard from, but there's a lot of teachers that want the five days to get back going strong on this and, and finishing the year strong. So am I open to all, all kinds of ideas with contingencies? Absolutely. But at the same time, I think our community has spoken too in terms of what their needs are, especially for the youngest learners. And I don't want to discount that either. I think, Dan, were you finished? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I think my only pushback on that will be, and, and you know, I, I guess it's how you interpret it, but I think for me, the choice of four days that could turn into five, I think that kind of muddies the water, at least for me a little bit, because I, you know, there's so many ways to interpret what someone who would have selected that meant, you know, it could have meant, meant let's start out at four because I know there are people who are uncomfortable and then let's absolutely get to five. And then there's people who are like, well, I'm really comfortable with four, but if our numbers go down and more people are vaccinated and maybe kids start getting vaccines and maybe, you know, maybe I'd go to five. So I, I just think for me, it's, it's really difficult to look at a community consensus when the numbers are so close and the five day week is, is under 50%. So you know, I, I, I guess that's what's making me struggle. And I'd hate to make a decision just on that alone. You know, I, I think it, now that where we are in the year, I think, you know, I think a lot of has been thrown around in the community about the teachers and, you know, what their motivations were. And while I won't deny, I mean, even as a parent, I was nervous in the beginning back in when we were talking about school even reopening at all, because we, we just didn't know what we didn't know about the virus. I don't think that's the concern. It's not what we've been hearing from the teachers. Um, their concern is for them to be able to educate kids to the best of their ability. And because they are our on the ground experts, I, I just wanna make sure that we are hearing their concerns about how the kids will be taught um, it absolutely, you know, I, we, 
between the two cohorts, it should be as good an education as we can possibly give them, of course. I don't think anyone's you know, debating that or saying that won't happen. But um, I, I, I guess I just want, I, I'd like, I, I appreciate that things are still on the table and maybe as everyone comes together, you know, they'll come to something that is where, you know, what you're talking about tonight anyway. But I just wanna, you know, I think for me, the survey was, you know, important and obvi obviously a very good data point, but it was a little muddied to me because of that third choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree, Kelly, and I think we have to be careful when we talk about stakeholders, you know, what the parents in the community want and the teachers want, because it becomes this, seems like a tug of war between, you know, what people can see as competing interests or, you know, putting people in, in different corners is, you know, the teachers want this, the parents want this, who are we listening to? End of the day, it's what's best for the kids. We have to start with that and, and look and see what we can do to support the kids. So I agree, Kelly, uh, you know, our administrators and our teachers are our experts. So this week we'll hear back from them about what the process is going to be. But, um, you know, we definitely want input from our stakeholders, but I just, I get concerned because sometimes it feels like, you know, we're, we're saying we're listening to, you know, we, the parents, and then that feels like we're not listening to the teachers, to people in the community, or vice versa. So, you know, we are listening to everyone, but I think as Mark who said earlier, we're not gonna make everybody happy. You know, we're not King Solomon. We're just trying to do the best to juggle what's all of these things and do what's right for the students in the end. So if I can just add one last flavor, I think we're all trying to row in the same direction and as much as we'd like to jump in and get things done right away, I don't think it's uncommon to say to ourselves, okay, let's shoot for the next marking period to say, let's start here. And so I think it, it's prudent that we shoot for this marking period or the last marking period rather to say, let's jump in and let's make sure that each of our constituents, whether it's parents, teachers, administrators, are all on the same page and we're all in agreement, this is the direction we need to head in, right? So we end up with an end of the year that we're all satisfied with. So, you know, it's okay. It's okay to take our time. It's okay to say to ourselves, uh, yes, wouldn't we love to be able to start tomorrow to get our kids five days a week? Sure. Wouldn't we love to start our kids in four days a week with the C cohort and know exactly what we're going to do? Sure. But we're all struggling with trying to figure out the best way to get our educational fiscal year to June 30th. And so, you know, it, there's going to be bumps in the road. It's not going to be perfect, but we're okay with April 19th. I'm okay with April 19th. Um, you know, I think we've done the best we can. And I'm okay with relying on the teachers. I'm relying on the Board of Education. I'm relying on the administrators. I'm relying on our kids. I think we've all suffered through an unbelievable year. Everybody has a story to tell. So let's shoot for April 19th. Let's shoot for trying to get our kids four to five days a week and let's just move forward. Let's be positive. Let's just move forward. Yeah, I mean, well I, I said, just- Mark, um, can I just remind I'm, I'm the board- I'm sorry, that's all I have to say. It's, uh, no, you said that very well, Mark, and appreciate that. But I did wanna check in with the board in terms of time. So it's 8.43. We're about an hour behind schedule at this point, and we have a lot left to do. So I did want to put that out there. If there were some quick 
remarks or questions that we had, I just wanted to mention that. So I see Rebecca and then Elena. Yeah. Um, listen, I can, we can all, I think, um, agree that we have listened um, to all stakeholders. We will continue to listen. I just think we're at this point now, well, I know we are, that until we have an administrative recommendation that the board can look at and discuss and then decide whether we're approving of that or not, these teachers can't move forward to try to figure out what will work the best for them in their buildings. I mean, from a governance standpoint, the administration will, is tasked to, to be presenting the recommendation to the board. We're, we would either approve the recommendation or come up with another recommendation, but we need to give them something to move forward so they can start the work that needs to be done in order to open. And if, and maybe, I just don't want to, I don't want to be concerned that I'm hearing that people aren't going to want to be making a decision on a recommendation this evening, which I believe is where we're headed, that we will be hearing a recommendation because we don't want to hold this back anymore. Mark, as you said, we need to move forward and get this done. I mean, we, we've been blessed in this district with not only a wonderful community, but our teaching staff, our support staff, our administrators, I mean, transportation, food service, all support staff. We are so lucky to have who we have in this district. I mean, we just have top notch individuals that love what they do and they're passionate about what they do it. And everyone has said it in a different way tonight. But I just wanna make sure that as everyone is meeting in the buildings that they, it's very well communicated to them that my hope is, and I would think it's the boards as well, that whatever support is necessary, whatever support our faculty is looking for to make this a success, successful transition. And I know that, you know, we've, people have mentioned options, but whatever may um, be presented to the administration from the teachers, that we seriously take a look at it and provide the, you know, monies that would be required to make that happen so that we are supporting our faculty as much as we can. And I agree with Ellen. I mean, my recommendation is April 19th. It's K through four at five days. It's five through 12 at four days. And I am awaiting to hear from the teachers and the building principals on the implementation strategy. So I'm happy to define the what and I need to hear the how. But you're right, Ellen, if they need certain resources or whatever, I, I want to convey, I have an open mind, but I think it's got to be April 19th, five days, K through four, four days, five through 12. And either, like you said, the board can vote against me or they can come up with a better mousetrap, but I got to hear what that is. But my recommendation, you're right, needs to be a place where they can start their deliberations or they're going to be spinning their wheel wheels all week and we can't have that. So will that be coming this evening, Craig? Yes, yes, my recommendation, just like that, April 19th to start, five days, K through four, four days, five through 12. Well, do we need to approve that as a board? I mean, it's not listed as an action. I mean, Correct. this is it's really approving the return to school uh, policy proposal from Onondaga County, much and like if, did the sports. If I remember correctly, at the beginning of the year, we did not, the board did not approve the plan. We helped hash through the plan and did what we're doing here, but it was never a vote. It was an uh, administrative yeah. decision. But I read Elena's comments and listened to them as the teachers need something this week or they're going to be spinning their wheels. But that was my understanding that where we were headed through all this, because yep. typically that's how it would work. It, now, if you had something else in mind, that's fine. I just want to make sure that we're all clear on that so that we aren't spinning our wheels this evening. Yep. There's so many different opinions and you all touched on so many of them tonight. I mean, that's the whole idea of a governance team is there, I wish the survey results all, all came back and shaded in one color. I mean, but people disagree on everything. There's some families that are upset we didn't put the hybrid model to continue. They like the hybrid model. After all, we heard against the hybrid model early in the year. Now it seems to be a safe haven 
going forward. So I found that interesting to hear. So we've all been touched in different ways and we've heard from different constituents and, but uh, you know, we're trying to ramp out of this. And for me as the leader of the organization, I wanna know some things before September. I do not wanna go through another summer of getting guidance in mid July, racing to get the plan in by July 30th, holding the advisory committee meetings, the public information meetings, doing multiple surveys, and then, you know, uh, rushing to get things around in September with staff development days up front. There's things we can learn right now, uh, right out in front of us. Kind of like our fall two sport teams prepping now, you know, for some it's their senior season on the end for fall two sports, but for some they're prepping for hopefully what will be autumn sports coming up in just a few short months. So I think there's an opportunity here in front of us to get ready for next year and to learn a lot as an organization. So okay. Craig, I will say that we all need to start rowing in the same direction, right or wrong. Uh, you know, I'm sure each of us has our own personal opinions, but I think as a district, we have to step back and say to ourselves, the 30,000 foot view is we all move in the same direction. So moving forward, I would agree that K-5, we start five days a week. Eight, or uh, I'm sorry, 612, you know, we start four days a week. We offer the most we can to the C cohorts that we can to those teachers that are going to be experiencing the pressure of you know, trying to administer to the four days a week plus the C cohort. And we just, we, we admit, we admit we're not gonna be perfect, but we move forward. We all row in the same direction. Let's, let's try to get to the best we can offer to our community. So Marissa, can we vote for that right now or do we wait till 3.19? So we're not again voting on the, Dr. Tice is telling us what his, his plan is. The plan is for teachers this few weeks to look at the five-day model, decide whether it's the instructional support or the remote cohort. We are voting later on to reopen schools with the three feet of social distance. Gotcha. Um, okay. All right, so now I'm really confused because just to just to clear it up, so we we need obviously to have Dr. Tice. You know, he normally gives us an administrative recommendation, and we vote on something. Okay, that's the normal procedure: administrative recommendation from the superintendent, and we vote. And what he's telling us is it's it's the same as an administrative recommendation, but there's nothing for us to vote on. He's telling us this is what his he and the administrators. And I want to make it clear, not just Dr. Tice, he working with his administrators, his cabinet, have come to this conclusion that it's five days at elementary, five days with instructional support or five days with um, a remote teacher. And then the high school is four days. So that's what they've, the conclusion that they've come to. Our job, our policy decision is voting on the reopening piece, which is coming later in the agenda. Yeah, I mean, that really wasn't what's been described all along that's going to be happening. So, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't understand how we can have administrators move forward without, without the support of the board. It just doesn't make well, sense. Well, I mean, that's what the whole discussion was for. And I think that's what, when you asked about, you know, what Dr. Tice recommended and, and went down that road, that's when he was very crystal clear. This is what he and the administrators are recommending for the district. And this is what they're basing their discussions with the teachers on this week. But as a governance team, we have to be together, whether or not five people think one and four another. I agree with that. I think that's what Mark just said. So uh, I will move that we adhere to what the administrators and the board, or I wouldn't, I won't say the board, what the administrators have recommended moving forward with the decision at this time. 
So, Mark, you're making a motion that <laughs> I get where you're going. I'm just. <laughs> I'm oh, just good lord! To, it's right. not part of the process. Just... Yeah. I get where you're going. Can we uh, just all just say that we support? I mean, look. At the end of the day, we need to support the, this, this district. So, is there anyone here who is who does not feel that they can support the? what the administration and the teachers are going to are going to arrive at. I mean, what's the question here? What is yeah, the question? I'm beside myself because I'm, I want to recommend what the superintendent and the administration has proposed. So they're proposing either five days with instructional support or five days with a remote teacher at elementary and four days at high school. Right. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't want to like, debate the details of it. I just right. want to move forward. Let's get our district moving forward. Okay. I, I just I just want to draw, a, 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 I'm confused. I'm hearing a different version from Dr. Tice and you, Marissa. I understand that the administration has put forward at the elementary level two potential models but that they were looking to the faculty to see if they could come up with any other models that they would suggest that they could, as a consensus, agree to move forward and in the best interest of the students and the way they could teach. Not that it's a fixed directive, it's A or B. So am I hearing that wrong? That's what I thought these meetings were this week is, is yeah, here's A and B, but if there's something else that really works, for you and the students, then let's hear about it so we can consider it. We being, obviously Craig being the administrative team. I, I didn't understand this to be a fixed A or B option. If you're asking me, yes. I mean, we put forth A and B, but we said if there's something else that we haven't heard yet, that C could go forward or D or something we haven't met yet. That was done in conjunction with FMTA stewardship that uh, we're, we're open, we want to listen, but at the same time, I was called to, uh, invited to uh, participate in an FMTA uh, rep council meeting that the entire membership had a chance to listen into. And I said, I want to look for the win-win. I do understand competing thoughts and competing ideas. I've listened to everything this whole past year, and I understand my heart goes out to a lot of people who have differing viewpoints. And I wish there was one broad brush stroke that I could do that would make everybody happy. One thing is certain is that I cannot make everybody happy with whatever is selected. But to go to Mark's point, we got to pick something look for the win-win and move forward, but at the same time, keep our antennas up, our ears open, and to listen uh, to different possibilities. I, I want to learn. I do not want to hit- Greg, and I can appreciate you wanting to hope for a miracle, but it's not going to happen. All right, so we got to move forward. We got to say to ourselves, let's get down to the brass tacks and move forward. Nobody's going to be happy. Nobody's going to be 100% on board, but we got to move forward. We're FM, right? We're the best freaking district in New York State. If not Central New York, let's move forward. We can do it. Go, just move forward. Dr. Tice, oh. if I could jump in for one second, just to Dan's point, just to be crystal clear, because we have to be clear on this, and I think Mark... This gets to your point as well. The meetings this week, which I won't be a part of, that's really not my arena, but I will support the teachers in whatever they need. But to be clear, the meetings are A, B, C, D, related to the support for five day a week instruction at the elementary level. It's not to discuss other models outside of that. It's to work within those confines. So I just wanna be clear, that's the recommendation of the superintendent. If, if there's a different recommendation, we need to know now, spinning our wheels through the week and thinking that there are lots of different models, no, lots of different scheduling models that we can have, that will, will probably not get us anywhere. So we need to be clear leaving tonight, if you are supportive of the superintendent's decision to move in a five day a week model and let us work in that model and we can get the work done then. So Jeff, thank you, because I was going to ask for clarity on that, Craig, after you spoke to that. Um, most recently, because I, it sounded confusing when you were saying A, B, or C, 
um, because I didn't see how that work was going to get done in such a short amount of time if there wasn't a definite um, choice moving forward of five days at one level or four days of K-12. You have outlined what your what your recommendation is, but I want to make sure that the board understands because I keep hearing from some board members, the superintendent and administration. I mean, it's the superintendent's recommendation always in all that we do. So it's it's not he is he is giving the recommendation at the top as he has stated as a leader of this district, and then the administration will go with that recommendation and go with what we've agreed and they will move forward and, and get the work done with the principals and the teachers and the buildings and the district and the support staff. So it, it's, it's Dr. Tice's recommendation that's being made and being presented to us. And although Marissa, you're saying we're not voting, I, I don't, you know, whether we wanna Consens consensus not as somehow you're going to have to know, Craig, whether we're okay with that model moving forward. So is there a consensus on the board to move forward with this model? Okay. All right. Not perfect. Thank you, Mark. I think you said uh, everything Derek very God, well. Let's yes. Okay. Forward, Anyone please. not on um, consensus? Okay. So we do have consensus to move forward. I'm really looking forward to hearing what comes out of those meetings this week. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to quickly while I feel like I'm escaping, move forward to item 2.04, the superintendent's report and statistical review. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Tyson and Dr. Coughlin. Yeah, you've heard oh. enough of me. We'll go quickly uh, through this. Thank you, District Clerk. Uh, this is typical of what uh, I do every year. Uh, usually uh, Mr. Gordon and I are presenting in the fall. The data usually comes out in March. I fine tune it over the summer and present to you in the autumn. This year has been anything but normal. We lost the testing cycle in uh, the spring of this past year in 2020. The data, believe it or not, for 1819, as I think I shared with some of you, the last part was not posted on the state ed website until December of 2020. So I do think the uh, uh, educational research and uh, unit at State Ed is, uh, and statistics is definitely understaffed. They're still working through things, but ironically, even though this is about 18 to 20 months in terms of old data, it is the most recent data. It's the data that helped Mott Road earn their blue ribbon. Uh, and it also probably will be the data that will be compared against as we go forward post pandemic when the testing starts up again. So you all have your annual report booklet, which is very similar to the past six years since I've been here. It's laid out the same way. I'd like to thank Dr. Coughlin working uh, with our BOCES representative, uh, Lisa O'Neill, to get some of the graphs that are in there uh, from uh, other uh, performance and, and comparable districts across the state. So let me talk, walk you through some of the longitudinal data that uh, we have in front of us. Enrollment, as you can see, uh, there has been a steady decline, although things have leveled out a little bit. Uh, it actually went up in 2018 and only to drop off again, but uh, we saw about uh, 700 uh, student drop over the past decade, but uh, most recently it is kind of leveled off in terms of only about 300 uh, of the last year. Next slide. Attendance rate has stayed pretty consistent. Uh, uh, one of the highest districts uh, in the area and attendance rate is very strong for our students at 96%. The FRIPL count, ever since uh, the economy crashed in 2008, it's gradually increased a little bit as more and more families in Fayetteville Manlius are in need of free and reduced price lunch help. The suspension rate has uh, been pretty level as well. Uh, we've been as high as 3% about a decade ago, and uh, we've averaged about 1% over the last few years. Percent turnover in faculty, that was uh, in the low uh, teens uh, originally, and then over the last few years has been in the single digits, uh, which is good, and uh, credit uh, Mr. Gordon's work and the mentor programs that we have with our veteran faculty. 
percent turnover with the novice faculty, uh, case in point, it's dropped right off. As you can see, uh, there was considerable turnover, but uh, things have uh, dropped off. There's been a slight slope there, decrease uh, in terms of working with our faculty with less than five years of service. Pupil-teacher ratio. Often you hear about school districts, they've lost students, but they haven't adjusted their teaching ranks accordingly. As you can see, our pupil-teacher ratio has stayed consistent. So even though we've dropped in uh, population and enrollment, uh, the teaching staff uh, has been adjusted as well. So that ratio remains at roughly about 13%. Our Regents Diploma and Regents Diploma with Advanced Designation. This is out of one cohort uh, uh, that's reported. It's consistent. All this data, as you know, within that annual report is verifiable. It's all on the New York State report card on the, uh, the web. Uh, you can see we're at 94% for Regents uh, graduation with 73% of, of that uh, in terms of Advanced Designation. Dropout rate is minuscule. Uh, very proud of our efforts to meet the students where they're at. A lot of credit to Dr. Kilmer and the high school team, counselors, teachers, working with the children to try to minimize dropout in Fayetteville manliness. As Mark said earlier, we're one of the best districts in New York State. Total general fund expenditures. This is everything in terms of uh, all uh, aspects of the budget. You can see that uh, with the economy, there's been a gradual increase in that, but pay special attention to the next few slides. Next one, instructional expenditures. Again, just the instructional part of the budget, which is about 70 to 75% here in Fayetteville Manlius is earmarked uh, towards student instruction, actually kind of leveling off and plateauing, which is interesting considering, as you saw on the slide before, the general fund overall, which includes everything, instructional, uh, debt service, uh, administration, sports, everything is in that part, but you can see instructional expenditures have been pretty consistent. Next slide, please. Special ed, on the other hand, has increased. Uh, you can see a steady rise and even exponentially uh, the last few years in terms of per pupil special ed expenditures. Now you may think that's because uh, we're seeing more students in special ed. Next slide, please. But that is not the case. There's uh, higher need students coming in in terms of the dollars being spent, but uh, under Ms. Deneen's uh, tutelage that we've been pretty consistent in either the low nines or high eights in terms of uh, last year, uh, about 8.7% students with disabilities. So I think it helps for us to kind of look in the rearview mirror over the past decade to see where I've been. It's always a pleasure to report that out to you. Like I said, the more specific data in there uh, certainly as I think speaks volumes to where this district has achieved uh, over uh, time and we should be very proud of that. And uh, the work of Dr. Coughlin and the instructional specialists and the teachers and administrators have worked very hard. And I know this past year we've been without the state testing, but that certainly uh, cannot speak to the work that's being done with formative assessments. And Dr. Coughlin, would you like to share with the board some of the things you and your team have been working on in the absence of these state tests? Sure, thank you, Dr. Tice. And I do have some data to share with the board and I will um, give that to Dr. Tice to um, put in board correspondence in the, in the interest of time here tonight. But as a follow-up to um, Dr. Tice's report and questions that have been asked about how we are addressing um, and monitoring student growth and evaluating programs this year, we look at multiple pieces of data. Um, we're looking at data from the first semester that's assisted us in um, adjusting curriculum and instruction, as well as identifying students who could benefit from student support services and academic intervention services. Uh, data from last semester and this semester will be critical as we realign K through 12 curriculum to address uh, interrupted learning since the start of the pandemic last March. Um, I just really wanna underscore that we're not 
talking about learning loss, which is seems to be the rhetoric nationwide, uh, but rather unfinished teaching, unfinished learning and interrupted learning and uh, giving students the opportunities um, that they've that have been interrupted since last March. Uh, as Dr. Tice mentioned, classroom teachers are continually monitoring uh, student progress with formative assessments and ongoing adjusting instruction and providing support. And that more than ever is going on this school year. Um, in addition to changing instructional pedagogy and adjusting um, curriculum. So in addition to the formative assessments, there are other pieces of data, multiple pieces of uh, data that we use. Uh, for example, and, and some of this information or this information I'll be sharing with the board. Uh, so first semester, we looked at high school and middle school overall passing rates of courses for marking periods one and two, um, looked at the percentage of students who passed all their courses and we compared that to the past three years. Also, first and second marking periods at both middle and high school, we took a look at um, <laughs> students in the hybrid model and those in total remote and, and made some comparisons there. And we will share that also, building administrators will share that with um, teachers. Um, at another example of grades K through six, we are examining three-year trend data from our math unit assessments um, that students have taken this year, September to February. Our, those math unit assessments, if you're not familiar, are locally developed common assessments based on our math curriculum. Uh, and data from these assessments not only gives us individual student performance data, but also helps us to assess our overall um, math program. And another a couple of pieces of data at the K-4 level, students are administered, it's called Fontes and Pinnell benchmark assessments, and that helps teachers determine independent and instructional reading levels. So we have some data in that regard. Also, as part of response to intervention, K-4 students are administered Ames Web Plus reading probes and um, just to mention there, typically we give those measures first thing in the fall and we have fall, winter and spring benchmarks, but uh, we did not um, do that in the fall um, considering all that the students and teachers had to contend with. So our first point of data there is um, the winter piece. Uh, as Dr. Tice mentioned, I, I'd like to mention also again that we work very closely with our data coordinators at OCM BOCES, Lisa O'Neill and um, Tina Boots. And this service has been invaluable. Uh, both Lisa and Tina are instrumental in helping uh, the administrative team and teacher leaders with um, analysis uh, and com compilation of data and um, keep us uh, on course with our New York State accountability measures and subgroup performance, which is critically important information as well. Um, as I said, I'll, I'll share all that data. Um, and just to mention a couple of things moving ahead, uh, again, we'll just continue to be looking at data this spring and making curriculum and, and instructional adjustments. Obviously, when, as students are in school, more, um, there will be some changes there. Dr. Tice mentioned that at uh, grades K and one, we um, started the blast off kindergarten and first grade early morning program. So we have um, students at all three of our elementary schools coming in early for uh, additional help. Um, and you're aware enrichment period and ninth uh, period, enrichment period at the middle schools and ninth period at the high school extra help and um, also starting up at the high school, some, some clubs and activities. Um, and again, a lot of work that will be happening this spring and uh, this summer, we certainly are going to have our work cut out for us. Uh, we have the incredible good fortune here at Fable Manly. As I've, as I've said, almost every time I have the opportunity to tell the board, we have our wonderful resource teachers, department leaders, and instructional specialists, as well as our all of our teachers who are very involved in, in curriculum development and participate in a lot of curriculum work over the summer. So that will be taking place and we'll be looking at realignment. 
um, professional development in the summer and recalibrating and a lot of realigning. Um, we are beginning to look at what we can offer for summer programming. Um, we will have our typical uh, regional BOCE summer school for grades nine through 12. We are also adding um, as long as the, we can get the staffing, seventh and eighth grade, English language arts and math, and hopefully Spanish this summer, um, and that's new. We are planning to uh, 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 have a much more robust K through 12 summer literacy camp, uh, recognizing the incredible critical importance of students and their early literacy foundational skills. And in particular, our kindergarten or first and second graders who would be eligible for this program um, have had very interrupted learning since they set foot at Fable Manlia. So um, we plan to have the K through two summer literacy camp. And um, we will also be making uh, resources available for kindergarten through sixth grade and hope to continue that uh, families and uh, students can have access to online programs that we've been using throughout the school year. Um, so um, those are some things that are going on. I'll share the, the data. Um, happy to uh, present more detailed data. Um, but again, in the interest of time here this evening, I'll. I'll just um, leave it at that. And um, I will say this is an incredible team effort with, again, our teachers and administrators um, constantly looking and checking and readjusting and realigning. So that's where we're at. Thank you very much, Dr. Tice. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Coughlin. <laughs> you, uh... That was fast. <laughs> that was a mixed report with a lot of information. <laughs> a lot of information in it. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, any questions for Dr. Coughlin? I just want to th say thank you, Mary. I really appreciate you going through the details. And I know it's been a crazy year. And I just really appreciate everything that you've done. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mark. I, again, it's it's a team effort. I I don't every every day we uh, work with phenomenal individuals, and 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 again, it's just a team effort, and we take one day at a time. And uh, everybody's working really really hard. So thank you. Again, and I'm happy to slow down at a later time and and uh, sh share more. Thank that, you. That that was a I lot. I will definitely Mary. need that. I, I, I definitely appreciate hearing that, Mary, and we, we all know it's been, it's just been an unbelievable amount of work this year with new stuff. I just have one quick question. I know you went through all of the things that are being done in it, not being about um, learning loss, but, you know, recovery, um, with the exception of one grade level, which is the seniors that don't get a recovery year. Um, you, you had mentioned, I don't know if it was you or Dr. Tice a couple of meetings ago, about a, it was a, a fancier term of credit recovery, which is obviously for students who have not passed some of their classes that may be at risk for uh, staying with their class for graduation. So can you, if you dug into that, do, do we, mm -hmm. do we know where that's at? Do we have students at risk and, and can yes. you just speak to what's um, being done for those? So uh, Dr. Kilmer and the high school staff are, are on that. We did purchase, uh, it's called Grad Point. It is a credit recovery program. So that is available. Um, and I know um, there are a handful of students using that. I also know, uh, I do not know the specifics, but it, there is a, 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 I know an English offering to help students who struggled and did not do well the first semester and um, doing all that we can to get them across the uh, finish line there at graduation. So, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Sure. Okay, thank you, very, thank you again, Dr. Coughlin. Um, moving on to item 2.05, committee and representative rep uh, updates. Um, the minutes from the most recent me meetings are posted. So with the board's permission, I'd like to just have our student board member in the interest of time give her report and then refer board members to the information that's been posted for them to review. Is that okay with everyone? Okay. All right, Lucy. 
Okay, I have, I think some of the questions have been answered, but I'm just going to ask my six questions and do what I have. So with all the new guidelines and the new restrictions, like the face shields, masks, distancing, and a bunch of other stuff in the school, I was just wondering if someone could clarify, like, what it's going to be like, like, if we're actually going to have to carry those face shields. Like, I know, um, I think McMahon came out with something else, or if we're going to do, like, the masks or, like, you know, just what's going on with that. And then another one would be how would the school deal with the mental health and the transition for cohort A, B, and C? So um, I was talking to my mom, actually, and she's like, maybe we could do a well another wellness day, like, that we can have in the school like we did in previous years. And then another one, kind of sports-related, when will spectators be back a lot at, like, um, outdoor games? This season might be different because it's more of an indoor-type season, but – in the fall, not the spring season, possibly spectators could happen. And then another one for freshman students coming into the high school with like a bunch of people is new for them. Will there be like another form of like link crew day and orientation with like the full high school and everything going on? Um, is and another one is the school gonna end on the same day as like published on the website because i've heard there's been rumors going around about that and then lastly um unified sports how can special ed students go back to the normal extra curriculars such as unified bowling some of their extracurriculars and is there a specific start date for unified sports and will there will the shortened season be like you know different and then how can we accommodate our special education students in the sports in school and extracurricular areas i wrote them down here so as far as as far as the desk shields uh, as of today thanks to the county executive we will not have to use them or carry them around i suspect they will be used for cafeterias uh, definitely probably at the elementary uh, level in classrooms and then in the middle school cafeterias. So uh, hopefully we will not have to worry about, uh, I think we made our point about uh, the secondary students having to carry the desk shields around. As far as mental health, as I said earlier, on everybody's mind, our counselors, as you know, uh, certainly they're hyper-focused on that. Item three, spectators. Uh, as you know, we allowed, uh, senior nights to take place for winter sports then uh, at the end opened it up to home fans we intend on doing the same thing for fall to indoor sports uh, maybe even opening it up a little bit earlier we want to get them underway uh, as you know we probably had uh, three or four teams in quarantine in the winter and we had two teams quarantine right out of the gate for fall too so uh, what's heavy on our mind is providing the opportunities for students i know family members want to be there. Uh, certainly they can be in outdoor venues and we suspect that will continue into the spring. Um, I know the administrators are worried about, uh, uh, you know, in terms of or orientation issues. In some ways it'll be September all over again for some of the remote students coming back. So I know they're making plans for that. As far as the end of school, all remaining regences, and there are not that many of them anymore, Dr. Kaufman can tell you, have all been pushed to that last week. So uh, we will be in operation, even the set, the secondary level at the high school, a little bit longer uh, this year than we normally are because the regents are now in one week rather than over two weeks. But the end date will remain the same. We have to get the 180 days in. And then as far as unified sports, I will check with our athletic director. I do know that they're working on that, uh, provide as many opportunities as possible. Being married to an athletic director, I know that other schools are looking into it as well. So um, I will have to check with uh, Mr. Sugar on that. Good questions. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks, Dr. Tice. Thank you, Lucy. Um, okay. I had, um... 3.01, um, approval of minutes from the Monday, February 8th, to, uh, 2021 board meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Thank you, Daryl. Second from Mark. Any discussion? Just real quickly, uh, we had talked in that, uh, in that meeting about approving the January 25th meeting minutes. 
and we had talked about making a change in section 3.02 of January 25 from a date of February 4 to February 5. And it doesn't look like that change got made or was noted. So I just want to bring that back to the surface. I'd be happy to take a look at that, Mr. Seidberg. Thank you. You will amend my motion to include that. All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. I am when opposed or abstaining. I am 3.02 approval of the minutes from Monday, March 1st. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Thank you, Sherry. Second for Mark. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? I am abstaining, Marista. Thank you. Abstaining. Thank you. I am 3.03 approval of minutes from Monday, March 8th. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Thank you, Mark. Second from uh, Jason. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Next on the agenda, item 3.04, personnel actions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of Fayetteville Manly Central School District approve the following personnel actions as recommended by the superintendent? Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Second from Daryl. All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Okay, next on the agenda, item 3.05, <clears throat> the 2021-22 school calendar. Is there a motion that it be resolved the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly School District approve the 2021-22 school calendar as presented? Thank you, Daryl. Second for Mark, any discussion? Sherry, oh, and then Dick Kelly. Sorry, I think I got it right. <laughs> I, Dr. Tez, I asked you this before, but um, have you looked up how this affects our Muslim uh, students with the holidays that are important, important to them? We did talk about it. Oops. Yeah, we did talk about it at the district office level. Uh, Eid al Fitr uh, next year will be May 3rd. It falls right in the middle of AP exams. So I do know the Jamesville DeWitt Central School District has taken the day off, uh, would mean postponing AP exams till a makeup period. Uh, we can always adjust the calendar as we go forward, but we would be making a decision for everybody in terms of rescheduling their AP exams. And if you recall, that was one of our concerns with the days. It was not that they were, not to use a double negative, unimportant. They were certainly important based on population, but they do float through different exams. So next year will be APs. It could very well fall in the middle of ELA and math exams going into the future. I think in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I, as we talked earlier, the students were going to get me an idea of what the proportion of students that would be affected by the Muslim holidays. I'm happy to entertain that. We can always adjust the calendar later. Uh, but it, I, it does come at a cost in terms of other students who may be non-Muslim having lost the opportunity for AP exams here if the buildings close. Thank you, Dr. Tess. All right, just quick. I know the what you would have been the traditional um, the traditional start of school, which is the Tuesday after Labor Day. Yes. And. Sorry, someone's taking my dinner to put in the fridge. Um, <laughs> um, so anyway, I noticed on the calendar that the first day of school will be a Wednesday this year because the first day of Rosh Hashanah falls on a Tuesday. Um, so does that mean that we're no longer going to have the freshmen come in a day earlier? Uh, no, the link crew will be on the 8th. Uh, it'll be a, probably a modified staff development day. Students would return on the Thursday, the 9th. Okay, thank you. And Yom Kippur, as you know, is the following week. So they're bundled early. It looks like this year, as you know, with all the staff development days front end loaded. Um, but yeah, we did try to account for that for September. My only short question was a couple of years ago, we had bumped up the number of snow days and then we're back down to three. Again, was, was there any talk about those numbers are the reasoning for those? No, it's just three. This year is four. As you know, we're saving the fourth day for Juneteenth, not knowing what the state is going to end up doing uh, this year. 
but next year definitely will be three. It would be nice to have more latitude if the state allows us to go remote like they did this year. So I know this year was experimental, as you know, it'll be interesting to see if that affords us more options going forward. Although I have to say, I had a number of positive emails from parents and teachers alike thanking me for keeping the tra tradition of snow days uh, just for that uh, impromptu uh, spark uh, in the middle of a winter storm. But uh, there was some pleasure with that. But yeah, we're back to three snow days for next year. Okay, thank you. Craig, a question for you. And I know the district made a change a couple of years ago on this, but the whole staff development day on May 17th, and I know it's the election day, but really the only two schools that are impacted is really Fayel and Wellwood. So just the thought philosophy there that we've got to take out all the other schools on a Tuesday. It's the same as what the, we see with November with the general election day, although there it's the high school and Eagle Hill. We could tinker with that as time goes along on, in May, especially if the state allows remote days to continue. Right now they, we have not received word on that. So I think we need to pencil in May 17th, but who knows what the way next winter goes. We may end up foraging for that day just out of necessity. We'll just have to see what the state gives us. We can always modify the calendar going forward, but I think until the state allows us to do remote days, I would recommend leaving it there. Fair enough. As a placeholder, but I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye, you're opposed or abstaining. Next on the agenda, <clears throat> secret resolution uh, type two action bus proposition item 3.06. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly School District approve the secret re resolution type two action bus proposition as presented? Thank you, Kelly. Second from Daryl. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. You went opposed or abstaining. Next on the agenda, item 3.07, secret resolution type two action transfer to capital projects. Is there a motion that, be, that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly School District approve the secret resolution type two action transfer to capital as presented? Is there a motion? Thank you, Dan. Second from Sherry. Discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. You opposed or abstaining? All right. Item 3.8, resolution 2020-21 annual budget notice. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District approve the 20 2021 annual budget notice with an anticipated amendment to the dollar amount for the Fayetteville Free Library proposition to be provided no later than March 25th, 2021. And the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby authorizes the district to update the legal notice as anticipated for Fayetteville Free Library without further need of board action. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. That's all I can see out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> can, can somebody get Mark a flag, please? <laughs> uh, so who was the second? I know who the first was. Thank you, Daryl. <laughs> Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and keep aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Let's see. Okay. You're killing me, Sarah, today. You really are. <laughs> all right. Okay. <clears throat> Item 3.09, Health and Welfare Services Contract, Oneida City School District. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District authorize the superintendent to sign the contract with health and welfare services provided by the Oneida City School District for the 2020-21 school year? Is there a motion? Thank you, Dan. Second from Kelly. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right, I am 3.10, resolution, OCM BOCES high-speed communication services. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly School District agrees to enter into a contract with OCM BOCES for the provision of said services to the district and not to exceed in total over the life of this agreement the annual amount of $46,962 and associated CNY RIC charges with such amount to include annual OCM BOCES support costs and applicable taxes and surcharges and with such support costs 
and applicable, applicable taxes and surcharges included at the current rate and subject to change as established in the OCM BOCES budget or mandated by any federal, state, or local authority. Is there a motion? Thank you, Mark. Second from Jason. Any discussion? Just real quick, is, Bill, is this a new service or is this a continuation of the existing service? This is under the uh, current service model with no increase in cost is my understanding. And it's because he, the city rec through all the joint management team ended up with redundant inter internet connections. So much like we did as a district, if you remember, he had redundant internet connections from our campus to BOCES. BOCES, I know, thought so that and other school districts were similar was such a good idea. They did it with all their joint management teams. So instead of just the city rec being connected to the internet, now each of the BOCES campuses are connected, which provides multiple linkages and redundant internet in the event there's a failure. So they did this all for the current cost, but uh, that being said, we still have to approve it. Okay, thanks. Did I get that right, Mr. Furlong? Yes, you did. It doesn't often happen at 9.30 at night, but I just, I wanted it to go on record. <laughs> All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye, anyone opposed or abstain? All right, item 3.11, <clears throat> addition to the district safety plan. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby approve this amendment to the district safety plan, which includes protocols for responding to a declared public health emergency in accordance with revisions to Education Law 2801-A. Is there a motion? Thank you, Sherry. Second from Daryl. Discussion? Thank you to Mr. Gordon and Dr. Montgomery for going over this with a fine tooth comb. This will be used in the next pandemic, 100 years from now. I will not be around to deal with it, but hopefully by then it'll be holograms and digital or whatever. But uh, Thank you, Mr. Gordon and Dr. Montgomery. All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? <coughs> <coughs> Item 3.12, resolution, spring sports, wrestling. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District approves offering a spring season of modified junior varsity and varsity wrestling in accordance with Onondaga County Health Department guidelines. Their motion. Thank you, Dan. Second from Mark. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 3.13, resolution spring sports baseball. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the F Board of Education of the F Fayetteville Manly Central School District approves offering a spring season of modified junior varsity and varsity baseball in accordance with Onondaga County Health Department guidelines? Thank you, Mark. Second from Daryl. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstaining? Next, 3.14, spring sports softball. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education the Fayetteville Manly Central School District approves offering a spring season of modified junior varsity and varsity softball in accordance with the Onondaga County Health Department guidelines. Thank you, Mark. Second from Dan. Any discussion? All those in favor, please state aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstaining? Next, 3.15, resolution spring sports lacrosse. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education the Fayetteville Manly Central School District's Approves offering a spring season of modified junior varsity and varsity boys lacrosse and girls lacrosse in accordance with Onondaga County Health Department guidelines. Thank you, Mark. Second from Kelly. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Thank you. Next, 3.16, spring sports. Oh, no. Spring sports, the <laughs> track and field. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fable Manly and Central School District approves offering a spring season of modified and varsity boys track and field and girls track and field in accordance with the Onondaga County Health Department guidelines? Thank you, Mark. Second from Ch uh, Kelly. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. We're opposed or abstain. Next, uh, 3.17 spring sports tennis. <clears throat> Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District approves offering a spring season of junior varsity and varsity boys tennis in accordance with Onondaga County Health Department guidelines? Thank you, Mark. And a second from Dan. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Thank you. Next, we have 3.18 spring sports golf. 
Is there a motion that it be resolved the Board of Education of Fayetteville Manly Central School District approves offering a spring season of varsity girls golf in accordance with Onondaga County Health Department guidelines? Thank you, Mark. And a second from uh, Jason. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Hey, Marissa, hey, a quick question. So, yes? Sorry, I know you're on a roll, but we approved. I need a breath. <laughs> We approved um, assignments for crew, and they're the only ones not listed as a resolution. Do we need to add a resolution to the agenda for crew? We do not. It's an extracurricular. Thank you, Dr. Tice. Appreciate it. Sorry to interrupt, Marissa. No, Keep going. No worries. But you approve, you approve the you approve the advisors. Okay. Now, Thank for you. some crazy reason, crew is not recognized as a sport by the state, which is well. Let's move on. All right, 3.19, Onondaga County Health Department policy proposal. <clears throat> Is there a motion that it be resolved the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby adopt the Onondaga County Health Department policy proposal, including but not limited to an adjustment to social distancing between students from six feet to three feet with a barrier while requiring six feet of distance between students and adults. Um, is there a motion, Mark, and a second from Kelly? Dr. Tice, do we need to change that to remove a barrier? Breaking yes, those? yes, please, please change it. Uh, remove the barrier just with masks. Again, this changed just today. Right. Well, so but this is, is a but it's a two-step thing. It's it's not just changing the resolution. We're being asked to approve a policy that requires barriers. So the policy hasn't been rewritten yet. So I, I don't, I don't, I, I would hate for us to approve that policy specifically since we don't have another board meeting scheduled where we would need to rescind it to approve a revised guidance document that we now presume is coming from the county. So clearly we need to move forward, but, but I don't see how we approve this document. Can we wait till we have the new guidance and then just call a special meeting to approve it? I agree. We, I don't I think, think this does us, this doesn't have much value, this vote. This is contrary to everything that we just said we would be doing. Well, so. with the exception not, uh, you are gonna use the barriers still for the cafeterias as we see. So the extended guidance is still there. It's just removing it far from the classroom. Right, but it says required in order to go to three feet in the classrooms, it says required barriers. And that's not what we're doing. So the other alternative is can we move to adopt this with the specific exclusion of any barrier requirements set forth in it? Or subject to. But barriers are still needed as outlined, I believe, Mr. Furlong, right? Page six for cafeteria. So, so we can still use barriers for three feet in cafeteria or else it's six feet. Um, I'm not trying to be a stick in the mud. I'm just aren't we going to have around. to adopt both? I mean, is the extended proposal a revision or a supplanting that? Yeah. It's an amendment, so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to vote on both. It's just a question of do we vote on this and tinker with it, or just wait and vote on both when the new policy uh, amendment is written? How long before you think that new guidance will come out, Dr. Tice? And would that delay anything that you're working on at the moment? No, I mean I, I think we just need to schedule another board meeting post haste. Yeah. We have to do that no matter what though, right? Yes. I mean, yeah. Can't hurt. Okay. All right, so we're gonna table. table. Motion to table. Thank you, Kelly. Second from Daryl. Thank you for the discussion. All those in favor, please state aye. I am opposed or abstaining. All right, uh, where am I? Through uh, 3.20 approval of policies part one. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby approve the following policies in first reading, waiving second reading? I'll see 1900, parent and family engagement, 5151, homeless children, 
5710 student transportation and 0101 gender neutral bathrooms. Thank you, Dan. Second from Kelly. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Next on the agenda, item 3.21, approval of policies part two. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby move the following policies into second reading the next board meeting? 3112, district brand identity use and 3600, lost and found. <clears throat> Make you mark, second from Elena. Any discussion? <clears throat> yeah, just one quick one, Sarah. There was one piece out of this. So paragraph four, last sentence, I thought that we had added uh, that, that this was for commercial and non-commercial products must obtain and comply with their licensing agreement and the obtain and language is missing from that. Other than that, Got no it. problem. All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye with the change. I am opposed or staying. Thank you. Um, item 3.22. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby approves the following policy in second reading? 7550, dignity for all students. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Daryl. Second from Mark. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Ongoing business, board development. So we had our retreat, our second retreat with Dr. Luvelle Brown um, to work on our board goal, our board diversity goal. Um, so our agenda, we looked at bias and culture. What is bias and how does it show up in our schools and daily lives? We looked at our vision, our, mis our mission. Um, and then um, just had a discussion about what it means to have anti-racist policy and to look uh, through an anti-racist lens at our school district. Um, that was the last retreat that we had with Dr. Brown and the board um, did agree to report on these at each board meeting for transparency for the community. Um, Dr. Tice, there was a question from a community member in regards to um, uh, curriculum. Can you speak to the DEI work that um, the state is initiating in the district, in all districts, not this district, all districts, please? The, yes, the state is initiating a review of the uh, DEI in terms of the curriculum for all districts. We do not know if it will be prescribed by the state heavy handed, so we await that guidance from the state, but it is built into the budget. <laughs> For next year, we have built that in as part of the process. Dr. Coughlin is also working with BOCES to take a look at opportunities for training going forward, starting with the administration first and then expanding to the teachers as we go forward. So that's all in process too. When you refer to training, you're referring to diversity training, correct? Correct. Yep. Okay. And um, is there any other? So we have the diversity training, we have the, um, the curriculum audit that will be next year. So the board, we have not had an opportunity to meet and discuss the um, next steps, the, um, the planning committee. I think that might be helpful if the planning committee got together to debrief our retreat and um, come up with possible steps for the board um, moving forward with that goal. Uh, what does the board think about having the, the the DEI planning committee meet to sort of debrief that last meeting and just have discussions about next steps for the board. That's that's what my thought is as well. And we should try to come up with some concrete steps to propose to the board at our next meeting if we can swing it scheduling wise, um, including looking at the sample policy that NISBA put forward. I think we should really commit to to looking at that and reviewing it and seeing if it's something we'd like to adopt as a district. I like to see us look at, there was a, a request about putting a welcoming statement on the, on the district website. I think that's something that we could um, come to some agreement on hopefully before the next board meeting. Um, so I think I'd like to have that on the agenda as well. Um, but we will get a doodle out to those who are on that committee 
um, for a meeting soon before our April uh, 19th board meeting. All right, um, next working agenda item, item 4.02. Another 4.02, 4.03 potential considerations for future meetings. Not seeing anything there. 5.01 future meetings calendar. Um, we do need to start talking about our meetings becoming in person again. I'm not going to do that tonight, but I'm just putting that on your radar. You know, we're opening up our schools in 19. Uh, we should um, look at having our next board meeting in person, so we'll get some information together and out to the board. So we can um, see how we can do that safely. Um, it's to remember consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? Thank you, Rebecca. Second from Daryl. All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Okay. So now we have a proposed exempt session for the purpose of discussing collective bargaining issues. And um, was that the only item? <clears throat> Excuse me. Or the, do you have another item, Dr. Tice? Or was it was just a collective bargaining issues? Uh, uh, two collective bargaining issues. Okay, two collective bargaining issues then. Is there a motion for executive session for the purpose of discussing collective bargaining issues? Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> and a second from Kelly. Any discussion? All those in favor, please state aye. Aye, anyone opposed or abstaining? All right, this is gonna conclude the public portion of our meeting. We're gonna go into executive session now and there will not be any further public part of the meeting. I wanna say well done on all the reading there, Marissa. We're gonna find a way to wave, you know, move all those at once. I gotta tell you. Yeah, consent agenda. Both 